And uh, it's not a pure in-memory database, that's times 10. So we only populate portions of the data that you choose, objects like tables, partitions, subpartitions, materialized views, into a columnar format in memory. For us, though, in memory is kind of an enabler, and I'll talk about that, because it's not the primary, well, it is the primary format, but we have other formats as well. For us, at least with the database of memory, it's really about the columnar format of the data. And so all of the technologies we're gonna talk about really focus on how to leverage that columnar format to scan data very, very fast. And that's kind of what database in memory is all about. We don't speed up OLTP, I'll talk a little bit about that. We don't, um, uh, we're not transaction processing. We enable you to run analytics directly on your OLTP data, but we're not gonna speed up OLTP, that's not what we're about. So um, that's more like the times 10 um, product where we, we reduce the latency and allow very fast high-speed transaction processing. But that's not database in memory. But reporting, so analytic reporting, number one goal of database in memory. Typically, we think of a 10x performance improvement. Something I talked about last time was real-time analytics and the, the ability to run analytics right on your source data, whether that's in a OLTP mixed workload environment or a warehouse, wherever Oracle database runs, database in memory will and oh, and actually that's a good point, because that sometimes gets lost in the, we'll talk a little bit about it, but uh, you don't have to change anything to run database in memory. You don't have to rewrite anything. It's part of Oracle database. Your application will run with or without database in memory enabled. There's no application changes required. The optimizer at parse time decides, do I select from the column store or do I select from the row store? You don't have to do that in your code. The optimizer takes care of that at parse time which makes it very easy to implement. And then uh, one of the other things is it can actually reduce your overhead because we think you can reduce the need for most of your analytic reporting indexes. And keeping indexes up to date is actually, at least in Oracle database, and I think in most other databases, a pretty um, resource intensive uh, requirement, takes CPU, generates undo and redo, and there's disk, uh, on disk pre uh, persistence for those indexes. And in mature applications, very often you'll see that uh, the index data is as much as the table data itself. And so it can be a significant performance benefit. Um, we'll talk about the column store. In memory, we're not doing anything. We're not, do, we're not having to keep persistence because that's all in the row store. So this actually can be a pretty big benefit. We have several customer stories out on the web that talk about justifying being able to implement database in memory simply because they could reduce the analytic or the uh, analytic reporting index overhead. So what is it? Uh, I'm gonna skip this slide. Basically, I've already said what it is. It's, it's all about analytic processing. Um, what we actually do is the Oracle database doesn't change. What we've done is, as part of Oracle database, we've added the ability to enable, so you don't, do it, you don't have it by default, and the question's gonna come up, so yes, you do have to pay for it, it's an option. In Oracle speak, options you pay for, and features you get as part of whatever you've bought, like Enterprise Edition, there'll be features, and options you pay for. And I, you know, it just, it costs money, and hopefully there's value there, that's the sales guys, that's not my problem. So that's, the Larry makes those decisions and filters on them. But, uh, as part of that option, as part of Oracle database, if you enable an initialization parameter, you enable it, uh, an in-memory underscore size parameter, we'll actually create another area in the SGA that will populate with columnar formatted data. And so we actually will have the sales table in this example will always exist in the row store. So that's the persistence. That's how it's recovered. When we populate it in the column store, in this columnar format, you see this in-memory column store, that data is there in columnar format to be uh, accessed but we don't have to keep it up to date. It basically goes away if the instance goes away. So there's no persistence associated with the columnar format. Very simple to implement. In memory underscore size uh, is an initialization parameter. You allocate memory. It's part of uh, an Oracle database. How many people here are familiar with Oracle? A few. So in Oracle, I'll, I'll go over the SGA, but uh, it will allocate memory as part of other memory pools that already exist in the Oracle architecture. Um, you alter a table, you basically define whether the object you're interested in 
will be enabled for in-memory, and so whether it will be populated or not. That's the part where it's not everything. So you actually can have a significantly smaller column store than your total amount of memory. Typically, people will be running analytic reporting on the most current data, so you can populate your most current data. Longer-term data can live out on disk and not be affected by the column store or database of memory. So you don't have to have terabytes of memory if you have a terabytes of data. You can actually get by with a, a fairly small amount of memory. I tend to say to, to our Oracle customers anyways, is that we, Oracle customers tend to be fairly memory stingy. Um, this idea that you're gonna have terabytes of data in your database servers is actually not very common. Uh, it's very, it's, uh, when I actually usually ask people, to, anybody having terabytes of memory is in a minority. Most people, 500 gigabytes, 256 gigs, that's much more on the realm. Exadata, by standard Exadata is 768 gigabytes of memory. So we're not talking having terabytes of memory. Although, if you have terabytes of memory, we can certainly populate all of your data in the column store. But that's not typical for most Oracle customers. And then later, dropping analytic reporting indexes. So that's pretty much it. That's all you need to know. You're ready to go if you want to uh, have an Oracle database, 12102 or higher, and you want to experiment. But there are the devils in the details, so we'll keep going. So it, I kind of said in memory is an enabler. So it's really the columnar format. Uh, in Oracle land, if you have an Oracle database, you can put the column store in DRAM, part of the SGA, as I mentioned. We also support uh, the columnar format in Flash on Exadata. Now, Exadata is a whole other conversation, but the point is that the columnar formatted data can actually live in any format essentially any memory storage format. Uh, flash, persistence, persistence, persistent memory is very close, and we're going to support persistent memory as well. So the Intel 3D Crosspoint or whatever they're calling it now, um, that kind of memory will also be supported because for us, it's the columnar format. The memory just <coughs> provides the additional speed, the ability to scan it very, very fast. But flash is still relatively fast as well compared to scanning off of disk, especially in a row format. Now we also support something we call hybrid columnar compression on disk on Exadata, and that's also a, a columnar format. It's not the same as a database and memory format, but we will automatically, if you're on Exadata, we will automatically transform the HCC data into database and memory for, uh, format so you can take advantage of things like SIMD vector processing and those in-memory storage indexes and all that, and you approach much better speeds than you would if you were running strictly off of disk. Plus, you have the I/O um, latency as well. Uh, and I guess I have all that up there. So why not just cache the table in the buffer cache? What's the big deal about columnar formatted data? I just have row. I can put all my tables that are row-based in memory, and it's the same thing, right? It's going to be just as fast. And the reality is, it's not. The columnar format is very, very different as far as speed goes. It, this is literally just a, uh, on my laptop, I do a by example session where I actually run Oracle database, populate, uh, I have 16 gigabytes of memory and so I populate that and I cache the uh, data in the row store, if you will, I create a heap pool, cache it all in memory in row format and then populate it in the column store and it goes from a hundredth of a, se a, hundredth of a second to eight seconds, the same exact data, scanning it in row format versus scanning it in columnar format. It's phenomenally fast. And I'll talk a little bit about what database and memory does, and for what it does, it really is screaming fast. Again, the devil's in the details. There are all sorts of other parts of a SQL query that we don't improve, and we'll talk about what we're working on to help do that, but the bottom line is for scanning, and joining and aggregating data, database of memory is really fast. So, in, in, yeah, there probably are other, I always get this, or I've been watching the um, industry lately, and since we're in the industry setting, I'll just talk about it. There are lots of other products available that do columnar format and database. There's major vendors that have format or, uh, uh, um, products, and there are third party small, small startup type products. They may or may not be faster than, than we are. One of the advantages for Oracle customers, though, is you don't have to move all of the data somewhere else. You can actually take advantage of this right where it lives. So I think that's an advantage. I'm not going to try to 
compare us to any other vendors. Um, Oracle really doesn't do benchmarks anymore anyways. We have one with SAP HANA, but other than that, Oracle kind of moves off on its own. So you, it's up to you to decide, does, is this fast enough in an environment that makes sense for you or not? But bottom line is, it is, it is fast. It's much faster than running in a row format. So you really can do analytics in real time, if you will. So how does this thing work? So we populate the data in pure columnar format. We actually do keep track of a row ID so that we can stitch columns back into their row values when we project the data back to either the upper layer of the query or from the query itself. But it does live in pure columnar format. We compress it. Columnar data tends to compress fairly well, typically anywhere from a 2x to 20x compression rate. And then we do a bunch of other fancy things on the data, as which I'll talk about as well. And it's anywhere Oracle database, 12102, which is when we introduced uh, database and memory, or higher runs, uh, you can use database and memory. You don't actually have to be on Exadata to use uh, database and memory. You don't have to be on the cloud to use database and memory. So any even on-premises folks can also take advantage of this. And one other uh, good point, since I did draw the, the comparison between the row store and the column store, <coughs> is that the column store is a store, it's not a cache. So Oracle traditionally has had a, the row store is, a, is handled through a buffer cache. So we only cache frequently accessed database blocks and all the rest of the stuff sits out on disk. With database and memory, we actually populate the entire object. And I'll talk a little bit about what happens when it won't all fit. But, um, and that's the enabler part, or if it's in flash, or if it's on HTC format. But the in-memory part is, is that's what gives you the speed uh, without having to go do an I.O. The columnar format is what, the, well, I guess I start the right way to say that, but the columnar format is what gives, gives the speed up, but memory also does because we don't have to want to, we don't want to have to wait for an I.O. to take place to access that data. So um, they're kind of, they kind of work together. Um, in Oracle uh, architecture, the Oracle database, there's an SGA, system global area. We live as part of that, this in-memory area. Notice I made it bigger than a different color, but made it bigger because typically it would be a much larger area in the SGA than you would normally have for your other um, pools like the buffer cache and the shared pool. So you got to think adding additional memory to your servers, which is kind of what the in-memory computing things about anyways. But again, um, Customers having terabytes or multi-terabytes of data is fairly rare, so um, you can get away with a fairly small additional memory footprint. If you steal memory, um, then you're going to affect your other workload, which can be a problem. So the way this thing is put together is uh, there are two pools as part of this in-memory area. So when we populate an object, we populate objects in what we call um, the one meg pool are IMCUs, the in-memory compression units. That's the actually the columnar data. And then we also populate a uh, snapshot metadata unit to keep track of things like changes to the data as it might occur through OLTP or DML type activity. So that's actually how it's architected within that in-memory area, that red box that I showed you. And it's as simple as alter table sales in memory. You can, that enables it for in memory, and the background will populate the data in the columnar format. Uh, no in memory, partitions, uh, you can pick and choose partitions, so maybe your most current partitions populate in the column store. Older partitions you might evict from the column store uh, based on your analytic activity. Typically people are running analytics on the most current data that they have, um, or some, some flavor of the most current data, whether that's six months or a year or what. But, is typically not running analytics on very old data, but you can if you want. Uh, there's various ways to handle that. But you have flexibility. It's that you don't have to populate everything into the column store. And the IMCU itself, the in-memory compression unit, that the, the actual columnar formatted data, is made up of what we call column CUs. And again, we have a row ID to keep track of that data so we can stitch it back together. And we just literally populate by reading it off of disk and populate it into this column store. So that's the, the initial part of getting the data into memory. Um, some people will uh, be concerned that population can take a long time. Um, but even in the row store, 
for Oracle, you still have to read the data into the buffer cache. It's just on a, typically on a onesie, twosie basis rather than the entire segment. When we do calculation, it's asynchronously in the background, so we don't prevent the database from starting up and opening. It's available for use. Of course, till that data is populated, you're not going to take advantage of the columnar formatting. Um, but uh, it, it, will, it, will just, it, will, it all happens automatically in the background once you've enabled those objects for the, to be in memory. And then I, I, I actually created this uh, fairly new. So, so we've talked about IMCUs. We've talked about the in-memory area being made up of two different pools. So an object that gets populated in the column store is going to be made up of one or more IMCUs. And each IMCU is going to have one or more SMUs associated with it. And then those IMCUs come out of the one meg pool. So each IMCU can be made up of one or more one megabyte chunks of memory. And an SMU comes out of a, a 64K pool, and an SMU will be made up of one or more 64K chunks. So that's kind of the architecture. All this is viewable within the database. There's V-dollar views that you can go look at to see how much space is being consumed, how, much, how many IMCUs and SMUs are associated with a particular object. If you care, there's nothing you can really do about it or do with it. But it, you can get an idea, um, especially with different levels of compression, of how big or how small you might be able to make that object in the column store, especially if you're you know, memory constrained. And as I said, population occurs in the background. We do have priorities available. Um, I'm not gonna spend any real time on this other than to say that these background processes are configurable. You can allocate more or less if you want, say when you start up the database, if you want to allocate all of your resources to populating everything so then you can turn your applications loose. You can crank up the number of processes available for population and max out your CPU capacity or, or CPU workload um, on your server to get things populated as fast as possible. Population does I.O., but in general, it's pretty CPU intensive. So we're basically transforming that row-based data into columnar data, we're compressing it, and populating it into memory. So they, the technology behind database and memory. So now we've got our objects populated into the column store. Um, we're running Oracle database, and we're going to query against this stuff. So why is it faster? So uh, the first thing is that we, uh, what I like to tell people is um, the goal of database and memory is to scan and filter data very fast. If the, the ultimate database and memory query is one that can do all of the work scanning the data and actually do that work there rather than having to do um, filtering the, the rows or the column values as they come back from the returning from the scan, not having to, to perform hash join and probing a hash table in the PGA, not having to do group by aggregation. We can actually do all of that work during the scan of the data, and that's what gives us the 10x, typically 10x performance improvement. Larry started off with, a, oh, it's going to be a thousand times faster, and that's really freaking hard to do. They accomplished it in a, a couple of the application processes, you know, like EDS and PeopleSoft and Siebel, but that's really tough. 1,000x is basically not happening for you guys. So 100x is reasonable to expect in certain cases. Realistically, 10x performance improvement is what you can expect over the row score. That, that to me, that's reasonable and achievable. So 10x performance improvement. So part of that is the fact that we can actually filter where you would have a where clause predicate, you can actually, we can actually filter during the scan of the data. We can skip over column values that don't meet the filter criteria. We can also do aggregations, simple aggregations, like um, function-based aggregations like sums, mins, maxes. Uh, we can do that during the scan as well. So we can actually, if you're, the simplest might be uh, selecting the max value from a table where the year is something and we can do all of that during the scan of that table and return the actual value back. We can project the values back without having to do anything else in, at the SQL layer, which is actually pretty cool. That's, that, that gets you the speed. That's going to get you 10x performance improvement. So scanning and filtering data, we can, so uh, aggregations and filter predicates. Compression, so there are multiple levels of compression. I said 2x to 20x. Where are we? Uh, keep track. I don't think we're going to make it very far, but I'll try to speed up a little bit. Um, 
symbol, basic symbol replacement and run length encoding at the normal, the default mem compressed for Cori low, mem compressed for Cori high. Capacity low and capacity high, we add a zip light compression to that. Typically, that's one of the areas where DBA or technical folks will roll their eyes and say, oh my god, there's going to be so much overhead to doing that. That's not going to be practical. And I have a blog post that goes out and talks about the fact that uh, for about a 30, for the highest level of compression, capacity high, for about a 30% degradation in performance, you can get about a two and a half times capacity benefit. And if you think about it, you're already in the order of, say we're, say we're happy path and we're getting 10x performance improvement. Knocking 30% off of that's not that big a deal for getting two and a half times more memory capacity. So it is a feasible thing to do. It's not just a dismiss it, I'm not going to think about it. It's actually worthwhile, even in the, especially if you're memory constrained. But the default is mem compressed for Cori low. Uh, Cori high can also have benefits. And there we're acting directly on the data. We only have to decompress it when we project the values back. Something we call in-memory storage indexes, similar to Exadata technology. Each of those IMCUs I showed you, each for each of the column values, the column CUs, uh, we keep track of a min-max value. So it's possible that we won't have to actually um, scan the IMCU itself. We can prune IMCUs if the community wear clause predicate. We don't, we're not going to hit any of the values within the range of the min-max values that are in that IMCU. So uh, it is possible to help yourself in the cases where maybe you, you sort your data in a certain fashion to make queries more friendly, we'll take that sorted data since we're just reading it off a of disk and populate it in that format as well. So that can, there's some tricks that you can do still even with database of memory that warehouse folks have done for years that you can play games with ordering and take advantage of something like in-memory storage indexes. And then simply vector processing, not a big deal. I mean, it's been around for a long time graphics processing, but we take advantage of it. We were at the AV512, I think that's what it, AVX512. So um, we make library calls out to the OS and the chips. And so we can do uh, multiple value comparisons in a, not a single instruction cycle, but in essence, a logically a single cycle. And so we can, that's where we go from, one of the big uh, abilities to go from millions of rows per second in the row store to billions of rows per second in column store. It's order of magnitude uh, faster processing, essentially just array processing. Rather than doing row by row or value by value, we can do a, a full array's worth of comparison. And that's good on Intel and Spark chips. I don't think anybody's using Spark anymore. But I think we still sell it, maybe you laugh. But, um, but into all the Intel processors have SIMD vector registers. So. And I think all of our competitors do the same. So the optimizer, so I said the optimizer is kind of the secret sauce. So you don't have to change your SQL to run with database of memory because the optimizer is fully aware of the column store, the objects that are populated. In Oracle land, typically you have to do, you have to generate statistics so the optimizer understands the number of rows that you've got, any data skew, all different columns. Um, and you uh, will, can be run automatically in the background, but that's an automatic process that goes through and runs based on the row data. Uh, for column store, you don't do any of that because mm -hmm. at parse time, we'll go scan the data and take a look at it and generate the statistics on the fly at hard parse time. But we also use statistics for the column store data to make that decision. Does it make sense to access the data through the column store or the row store? So again, you don't say select from column store or select from row store, you just run your query that selects from the objects that you're interested in and the optimizer decides, will it make sense to go to the column store or do I need to go to the row store? So we talked about scanning data. In addition, so uh, you can actually see uh, the first portion we I talked about is filter predicates. And that's actually an optimizer decision to be able to push filter predicates into the uh, scan of the column store where, where the code underneath the database of memory code will actually do the work. And you can actually see that in an execution plan. You can see what filter predicates uh, are being pushed into the scan of the column store. So you can see the red box there. And note that what you'll see is when we access the column store, it's table access in memory full. So people will naturally say, well, do I need to get, can I get rid of all my indexes? It, realistically, if you have a large table and you only need a one or two rows from that table, an index access is going to be the fastest way to get to that data. 
because you're not going to want to light up a thin memory scan of the entire object just to get two or three column values out of the rows that are associated with them. You're going to go to an index. And that's the beauty of the, co of the optimizer. It makes that decision for you based on cost. So I have a question for you. Go ahead. So the scan query that Ignite provides uh, will not be using this index version, right? It's Correct. It won't be used. So if we go, well, I have, if we go table access in memory full, no indexes are going to be used. So instead, you would see an index accessed by row ID, then accessing the table, and that would not be a no. So scan query not going to use this index, but if you're using the I, if you're searching like using a, a regular SQL and something like index in IDE somewhere, you will use index. I'm not sure I understood your question. Let me see if I can answer it. So if you're querying, take the optimizer is going to basically take a look at how, the cardinality of the columns that you're accessing. And it's going to say, well, I think I'm going to get half the data back from that table. So does it make sense for me at that point to access that data through an index or through the column store? Got so it. that's just a cost decision. Mm -hmm. And so the tipping point is typically really low. It's actually typically in the less than double digits. So 5 10%, somewhere in that range, it's going to tip over and do an in-memory access because it's typically going to be much faster. But it's based on cost. So it's going to measure CPU cost and I.O. cost. And so even though there might be indexes, it doesn't mean that the query necessarily will access those indexes, which is how you can get away with running an OLTP, which needs those indexes, versus analytic reporting, maybe even on the same mixed workload environment, and there you're doing table scans through the column store. Does that, make, does that answer your question? Yes, yes. Cool. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so um, hash joins. So actually, two types of joins. Typically, what we've talked about is hash joins. And so we can turn a hash join into a scan and filter operation. So uh, typically, in a hash join, I won't go through the details, but you're going to probe. Uh, you're going to scan one table, build a hash table, and probe from the other table. We can actually use, a, if you have a filter predicate, we can use a bloom filter and actually avoid the probe and only have to go back to the probe table or the hash table in the PGA just to materialize the values from the, the, the smaller table that we built the hash table on. So it's actually pretty interesting, I think, speed, quite a bit of speed up. You'll see bloom filters, join filter create, and then table access in memory full with the join filter use. So effectively, we'll scan one table, build a bloom filter, scan the other table, use the bloom filter as a filter predicate to accomplish the join, and then return the resulting Rows will project the column values from, in this case, the line order table, and any values that were associated with the date dimension table, my second table in the example, will get out of the PGA that we've already built the pro table for. And so it actually can give you a 6 to 8x performance improvement in a hash join. We can do more than just one. We can do multiple. So stars, think of star schema, star queries. We might have four or five um, dimension tables. We can build filter predicates, or sorry, we can build bloom <coughs> filters based on the filter predicates for the dimension tables and apply all of those during the scan, in my case, of the line order table. We can actually do it with a nested loop join as well. We, don't, we haven't really talked about that much, but in 12.2, we added the ability to uh, leverage an in memory scan. Uh, along with a, an index access. So we don't do them together. I mean, each individual table you can only access in one uh, format, if you will, or one access path. But uh, we can mix and match them together. So in this case, I have an example where the dimension table is being scanned because it's small enough to just, just to scan it in memory. And then we'll do an index uh, access of the line order table because we have an index that makes sense to do that based on cost. So it's relatively flexible. The optimizer is a pretty, pretty sophisticated piece of software. And then uh, the, the third big thing, so basically scanning and filtering data, joining data, and then aggregating data, group buys. So we can actually do something what we call in-memory aggregation or a vector group by. If you enable in-memory, you'll see a new group by called vector group by. We'll use key vectors so that we can create dense grouping keys. I'm going through all this really fast, you don't have to remember any of this. Uh, and we'll actually do the same basic join we do with a bloom filter. We'll, do, we'll scan the dimension tables, create key vectors, so we have dense grouping keys and our filter predicates. We'll apply the key vectors during the scan of the line order of the, the back table, 
and then we'll do the aggregation in memory in an aggregate accumulator um, using the dense grouping keys we got out of the, creating the key vectors to actually do the aggregation during the scan. There's a whole white paper that describes how this, how this works. So you don't have to remember anything that I just said. It's called in-memory aggregation. It's on our blog. You can just go look at the white paper if you're interested in it. The OLAP guys on the East Coast wrote this for us or created it. We implemented it into a database in memory. And you wind up, wind up seeing it with a, what we call a vector group by. Uh, if the vector group by winds up, if the key vectors and the, the amount of memory required for the aggregation is going to be too large, that's where you see this uh, hash group by. Well, we can fall back to the hash group by so that, and that kind of brings up the point, no matter what you run the database in memory, if you, uh, if you don't have enough memory, so not all the data is in memory, if you have to fall back because you don't have enough memory to handle the, in this case, the aggregation, your query will still run. It won't get an error. So any query, so that's one of the reasons you don't have to have applications certified to run the database in memory. As long as your application certified to run with Oracle database on the version you're running, you can run the database in memory. Because we guarantee that the queries will run without um, any errors, without any uh, wrong results. Query may not be, 10 minutes, wow, okay. The query may not be any faster, but uh, it won't error out. And so, and so, and that's why you have to, or why we have the ability to have uh, execution plans and SQL monitor reports. So in the case where you're running very large queries and you're not seeing the performance you want, you can diagnose it and figure out why without having to run a bunch of big trace files and, and plow through a bunch of um, stuff that nobody wants to look at anyways. So um, anyways, vector group by. So that's aggregations. So those are the three things that database and memory does really well in a SQL execution. Uh, filtering, aggregating, function aggregation of data, um, joining data, and then group by aggregation. Those are the areas where database and memory excels. It's not going to speed up sorting. It's not going to speed up DMLs. It's not going to speed up transferring millions of rows to your application tier so you can go through row by row figuring out what you need to look for as far as business logic goes. It's set oriented running in Oracle database. And that's what it's, that's what it's fast at. How does it handle data changes? We had a discussion last time, so I threw in a couple slides. Um, is anybody interested, or should I just, because I'm going to get cut off, so we'll, I can get through this, but. Um, interesting. I, interesting, okay. So uh, all the DML, all the changes you make to data always happen in the row store, just like they do without database and memory. Oracle database, the transaction processing architecture hasn't changed with database and memory. So we still have to generate undo and redo. We have read consistent view of the data. We can roll it back. We have recoverability. All that doesn't change. So you might ask, well, so how do you handle the column store? How do you keep it in sync? So what if I'm scanning the column store, but I've changed data? Do I get a, do I, am I going to get a, a, a wrong results from that? So the answer is we keep track of any changes to the data in these SMUs I mentioned, the metadata. And so we'll mark that data, as, in this case, as being stale. That row has been changed. And so we'll scan the data, and then any time we hit data that's been changed, we'll go to the row store and pick up the changed values, the column values, and return that as a complete, read consistent set of data from the query. So we, this is the other area where people will roll their eyes and say, oh my god, that's going to be so much overhead. This is going to be so slow, it's going to be ridiculous. So hold, hold on with me. So, um, and, and none of the, it's all SCM based. It's actually not a lot different than the same arc or uh, same code that keeps an index up to date. We obviously don't have to do all of the, the overhead of keeping the index up to date, but it's the same, same thing we do in the transaction, but this is all in memory. So there's no, uh, there's no logging of any of this, any of this stuff. There is there obviously, but not here. So it's just a memory, it's a memory change. That's all it is, it's very, very fast. And then when we scan the data, as I said, we'll scan it, we see it's changed, and we'll hit the row store and pick up any changed values. Typically that's relatively small. If you're changing the entire table, then it doesn't really make sense to have it in memory because, let's face it, nothing in life is free. This is how it works. If you're changing every row in your, uh, in your table all the time, then it's probably not a good candidate for database and memory simply because there's going to be overhead in keeping it all up to date. And you're probably going to be going to the row store to get all the change values anyways. 
So there is, I mean, still computer science. It's still code. So Oracle Database is just, you know, a bunch of application code. And so there are, this is how it works, and so this is, you factor that in. However, that said, it actually works pretty well as far as keeping track of what's going on. So in the case of, so we've populated the data, and now we're changing it. So we're, we've changed data. So there's two formats of how we keep that. Our goal is to keep this IMCU without any red X's through it. We want to, the ideal would be that there's never any change row or change column values in that IMCU. So when we scan the IMCU, we never have to worry about having to go back to the row store to get those values. So when it does change, and here what I've got is, I've got um, a bunch of row IDs that have been changed. I actually should put a bunch of X's there, but my IMCU isn't really big enough to, to do it. I think you can get the point. So we mark those values that changed, and so what we'll do is then we'll repopulate individual IMCUs based on hitting a threshold of a certain number of changes within each of the different IMCUs. So we don't have to repopulate the whole object, just the IMCU itself. IMCUs at the default compression level are typically about 500,000 rows. And you can see this in VM, uh, VDollar IM header. Um, there's a VDollar review which you can actually look at it. But anyways, um, and so the ideal then is obviously we've repopulated and now we don't have any changes with that. And we'll keep track of any changes that occur while this process is going on. We actually double buffer the IMCU. So this IMCU is still available while this, while this one is being rebuilt. And we'll get those values from the column store or the row store if values have changed and we need to go pick those up. And so that's the threshold kind of, so that's, that's the repopulation. There's a parameter where you can set how much, how many uh, process or how much CPU you want to allocate to repopulation. So the default's typically good enough. There is also the case where we, something we call trickle repopulation. So the case where, so again, we want that IMCU to be clean. So even if not all, we haven't met the threshold where we've uh, changed a bunch of rows and we've tri uh, tripped over the threshold, even if we're under the threshold, if we have spare cycles, we'll continue to repopulate anything that's got change data. In it. And so that's what we call trickle repopulation. That's also controllable through another parameter, because it would be Oracle if you didn't have a lot of parameters to control things. And so there's a background process that wakes up, see and checks that, and then again, we're gonna make a fresh copy of it, even though we didn't hit the uh, threshold for the number of changes, and, um, and we'll keep track of all that. And then, and then the idea being, we're trying to make as clean a column store as possible for you to do your queries again. So, uh, will response time suffer because of all this stuff we're doing? So Oracle already does a boatload of stuff in the background. We have log writer, database writer, we have more background processes you can shake a stick at at this point in Oracle database. And so the real world performance team did a demo uh, with a real application that showed on a, a three letter, starts with S and ends with P uh, application. Um, <laughs> they actually captured that workload and then they ran um, that work, we played that workload and we used database and memory to run mm -hmm. analytic reports on that workload with and without the data populated. So with it populated, as long as there was CPU capacity on the, on the machine, OLTP response time did not suffer. As soon as you ran out of CPU capacity, because database and memory is populating all the data in memory and it's using CPU to access it, so you gotta have CPU headroom to run database and memory. So in, as soon as you ran out of memory or CPU capacity, then we had to go to the row store and IO and everything fell apart. So with that, Translation, and there's a whole YouTube video of this that takes like 20 minutes to get through that you can go and look at. But the bottom line is that as long as you have CPU headroom, you should be able to run your analytic workload against any source data in Oracle database and not see degradation in the other workload that's running. And that's kind of the, the takeaway from all of that repopulation and trickle repopulation all that stuff going on in the background, having to go look at the data in a, um, that's changed in the row store and all the mechanics of it. The bottom line is it actually works pretty darn good. So hopefully that, that was worth the 10 minutes. <laughs> um, how much memory do you need? We have advisors. I'm just gonna skip through this stuff. 
and a compression advisor. So you can, you can run it on your existing workload and you can use the advisor to see how big your objects are going to be and try to plan out the memory and, and that's kind of normal. If you don't have enough memory, then you can do also, you can play a bunch of games with higher compression, you can exclude columns, you can use Exadata Flash, if you have Exadata, you can use Active Data Guard, maybe you want to run your uh, uh, analytic reporting on your standby database, you do it using Data Guard. And that's kind of the ways you can get around not having enough memory. And does it work with all the other Oracle database features? Yes, it works with Rack, it works with Multitenant, it works with um, whether the data's on, in the column store, on Flash, on a disk, in whatever formats it, it's in. You don't have to tell any, it anything. Oracle Data Dictionary Optimizer understands where the data is, goes and gets it on the fastest platform because it's cost-based optimization, and everybody's happy. I'm kind of speeding up because and, and I'll make these slides available. I was actually hoping to get through with some of this, but uh, I'll leave it at the, uh, there's some other slides. We have a whole bunch of new technology. Basically, we focused on increasing performance. We're already at CPU and memory, so now the idea is reduce the CPU cycles. Get the CPU footprint smaller, that makes it faster. Um, manageability, <coughs> rather than you having to figure out what objects to populate the column store, let's do it automatically for you. And so we've made progress there. Um, we're not there yet, but 21C, we're at 19C now. 2021's coming, and uh, the ability to automatically have a database based on heat map heuristics populate the columns or the, uh, the objects in the column store for you. Good stuff. And then lastly, expandability, flash, persistent, me persistent memory, um, external tables, being able to populate uh, um, big data type tables, HDFS, high type data, or whatever else data you have. Maybe be able to populate that directly into the column store without having to materialize it in Oracle database. Run your analytics and get rid of it. So that's kind of where we're at there. A whole bunch of slides that go with this. I will make them available so the guys at Green Game can download and, and take a look at it. Uh, since I'm already over, I know I'm over time. Thank you very much for letting me uh, speak to you guys. And if you have questions, I'll be hanging around. Or again, at the, uh, you can get the presentation, or I'll give you my card. You can email me. I mean, that's why we come to these things. So. Um. We can do five minutes of Q&A. Oh, okay, cool. If you, guys want to if you have any questions. <coughs> yeah. Are there any cases except uh, change in all roles where you wouldn't recommend using memory? Where you're just doing a little TP. You don't have any analytic queries to go for it. No, if I need to say. No. Basically, it's the, does, the, does the benefit of running analytic queries, the speed benefit, is that worth the cost of you know, buying the memory, buying database and memory, the option? Um, as far as I showed you, as far as you're uh, affecting your existing workload, as long as you have resources, basically CPU, in our case, and memory, because that's what we're, that literally that's what we're accessing, CPU and memory, CPU <coughs> flash, CPU persistent memory soon, um, so as long as you have that capacity, there's no reason not to, and you're getting a benefit from it, it's faster, then there's no reason not to. So mixed workload environments, um, warehouse environments, BI environments, um, precision support type environments. I have, we have a whole, on our blog, we have a, or on the, actually on oracle.com, we have a whole list of different customers and different use cases that they're using database and memory for. Can I enable in memory only for the period when I actually need the <coughs> to generate the class? So can I enable and database in memory only when, yeah. and then turn it off again? Yeah. And not pay for it? Or do you care about that part? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just don't want um, to spend it, spend the memory loaded with the data not, not, yeah. not used. Okay, okay. yeah, so sure. Yeah, alter table, no in memory. For instance, uh, what if during the daytime you have a certain le a level or a certain uh, type of analytic workload that isn't the same as you might have in your batch window at night as with your traditional? Um, you can certainly populate a set of objects for the daytime, evict them, and then populate a different set at night, evict those, and populate the other ones back again in the daytime. Because the population really doesn't take that long. You obviously, your mileage may vary, but you can certainly mix and match your objects. Um, the only problem will be that once the in-memory column store is allocated, 
There's no way to shrink it. So you can't dynamically shrink it to like recover that memory unless you restart the instance. So from that standpoint, um, you couldn't like uh, use it in one period of time and then set it to zero and do a bunch of other workload and then come back and set it bigger, big again and populate it. So that part's not flexible enough to allow us to, to shrink the column store. We can actually grow it, but we can't shrink it. You mean by shrinking, you mean to change the size? Or uh, change the size to be smaller. So if you're using in memory size equals 500 gigabytes, and but at some other point you would like it to only be 100 gigabytes, you, you can't make it 100 gigabytes. You can make it go from 500 to 600, but you can't make it go from 600 then back to 500. We're working on it. It's a little, it's a, a kind of a hard problem. There's a couple of, um, there's something called automatic shared memory management and automatic memory management, both that have to do with resizing the pools within the um, SGA. And we're working to make the in-memory column store function with that, but currently it doesn't. Does that answer your question at least? Yeah. It may not be the answer you wanted, but yeah. Is there any other questions? Yeah. In, in that case, right, you just define your from you increase from 500 gig to the 600 gig. But if you turn off the memory mode, you can turn off other one. The memory still be available for you for the using the other one, no? no. It's allocated all the time. So within yeah, within uh, Oracle architecture, oh. the SGA is a shared memory area that's allocated an instant startup. Um, then the, the pools, the, 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 these two types of uh, automatic memory management uh, techniques will allow the individual pools like the shared pool, the, the large pool, the buffer cache, the, um, uh, no, did I miss one? I don't know, I probably missed a couple. Anyways, those can all be dynamically resized by this algorithm, but not the column store. It's fixed in size. And if you think about it, for the most part, that's what you're going to want because remember, it's not a cache, it's a store. So we're populating these objects and they're not moving around, right? They're, they're populated in their entirety and they're going to stay populated until you do an ultra table known in memory. So there's really no reason for that to dynamically size unless you're moving around, uh, like on work shifts, a lot of different types of objects. Yeah, you turn off, then you just get it turned off, it does not make a sense. Once you allocate your memory still occupied, what are you going right. to use? Unless you can, you can deal with it. Yeah, unless you can tolerate an instance recycling <laughs> on instance memories. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. I think you said that you were able to only populate some of the columns or some, some of the fields. That, that went by really fast. I just wanted to clarify. You yes, you can. So the only caveat to that. <laughs> There it is. Is that you can say, uh, you say our sales table, say, uh, uh, so you can populate uh, an object and we'll su we support basically all the columns I said in there except the lobs, out of line lobs, and IOTs and hash clusters. But so typically a lob, unless we're talking JSON, which we'll just ignore for a minute, um, you're not going to do an analytics on it. So just exclude it. You can exclude, these aren't obviously logs, but you can exclude columns. Then the only caveat is if you wind up querying one of those two columns you excluded, like the zip code here, we gotta go to the row store to run the query because we don't have it in, in the column store. Now, in um, 20, maybe 20C, but 21C, we're gonna have this thing called hybrid tables. So we're actually gonna allow, we're gonna actually allow you to run that query and we'll go get that column after the fact, and we have to project it, we'll go get the value out of the row store. So we're actually gonna honor in-memory queries for those kind of those cases, and then we'll go pick it up out of the row store. But currently, if you do that, we're gonna, the whole query goes to the row store. Any other questions? Yeah. What happens when we run out of memory? Is the table close really fast? Yeah, okay, so so actually was, I was working today on a, a whole section of slides for population. So if the question was, what happens if you run out of memory? So let's say the case where you populated a table, it fit, but you're, you're undergoing changes, and eventually it outgrows the space that you allocated for the column store. So now you got maybe 90% of it's in the column store and 10% of it's sitting outside of it. So now look what happens, and actually this is the same case that happens when you start population, and part of it's populated, we haven't gotten to the rest of it yet, and so you say you have half of it in, half of it out. 
what happens is we'll, we'll use the data that's in the column store, we'll access it there in those IMCUs, and all the rest of the data will go to the row store and get it. So your query won't get an error, but it won't run as fast as if all of it was populated. And so you won't get an error message. You basically, you'll get an error message as you're out of memory at the, the DDA, you'll get an alert message. But other than that, this thing pretty much will run you know, uh, with, you know, other than bugs and maybe an OR 600 here or there. But basically, the application will run and not get any errors, whether or not it uses a memory. Whether or not it can use a hash join, whether it has to fall back for a vector group by into a hash group by, you know, just run. It, it may not run as fast, but it'll run. And typically, it won't run any worse than if you just use it all in the row store. In the sense of, if uh, we couldn't do a, a hash join, then you'll just use the row store hash join. So it'll be the same as if you didn't have a memory at all. So typically, we don't see much in the way of regressions. It's either as good as or better than it would have been without it. Am I done now? <laughs> okay. Is, hopefully, I answered all your questions. If not, again, I'll be hanging around uh, listening to the next speaker, and then um, and you, I, my email address is on the slides. So, if afterwards you want to download them and, and ask me a question, that's fine. So I'm more than happy to, to do that. Before we move to the next talk, I know a few people joined us. Um, um, as the presentation was going. So after this talk, we're going to do the raffle, and I just wanted to list the prices in case you guys are still thinking whether it's registered or not. So we have some cool stuff. We have a Lenovo Chromebook, Swiss Gear laptop, laptop backpack, and a vintage style suitcase record player. So we're going to have three people that are going to win prizes tonight. So stay till the end. All right, our next speaker is. Um, uh, Pat Harrison, Director of the Evangelism at Stream Sites. to refill the plates, I guess. You know, wherever you're comfortable. I just want to adjust the...
Mac and cheese from lobster was fantastic, really good, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to be talking to you about, uh, so the previous speaker, I didn't catch his name because I like Blake. Andy. 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 Previous speaker was talking about the benefits of an in-memory database, and one of the issues is often getting your data into uh, the database in the first place, and then uh, keeping it coming in cases where you're working with changing data. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So um, I'm going to be talking about a use case I came up with to kind of hang this around, uh, and a couple of technologies in Apache Ignite, uh, an open source in-memory database project. I'm going to show you how uh, we can integrate a tool from the company I work for, Streamset, with Apache Ignite to keep this data uh, flowing. Um, and if the gods are with us, the demo will work, um, and then I'll, I'll wrap up where we out of here. So just to introduce myself, uh, I'm Pat Patterson. Um, you can catch me on email at pat at streamsets.com. I'm MetaDaddy on every social network um, that I'm on. I'm always MetaDaddy, so Twitter, LinkedIn, <laughs> Facebook, what have you. MetaDaddy, wow. <laughs> I can tell you later why MetaDaddy, but... You, you, you fly in and back level the daddy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm the daddy of daddies. <laughs> so, uh, and in the past, um, I actually started what I do now, which is evangelism, uh, working with open source communities at Sun Microsystems um, back in the early 2000s. Um, and then I was a developer evangelist at Salesforce for five and a half years. Um, and now I'm director of evangelism at StreetSets. And random fact about me, um, I run a lot. So I ran a 50 mile ultramarathon in three weeks ago. So I, I like to run. Um, and then a little uh, slide about StreetSets. And this is not meant to be a marketing pitch. This is just a bit of context. Um, I'll get to the kind of techy stuff in about 30 seconds. We were founded by a couple of guys from Cloudera and Informatica. And they had realized um, when they were working at those companies that traditional ETL approaches to uh, the big data world and the streaming data world don't really mesh very well. ETL was built for situations where you have a very static schema, you're running batch jobs overnight, and a very different world from the one we live in. Um, in the five years since uh, we've been founded, we've got large and small customers. They split about 50-50 between global 8,000 and smaller companies. And the software has been downloaded um, by well over 2,000 uh, uh, individual entities and um, well over 3 million uh, individual downloads of the various artifacts. And we connect to about 50 or so uh, data sources and destinations. And we actually have a very strong history of open source innovation. Uh, many of our uh, developers have uh, been committers on open source projects like Hadoop, Spark, uh, Scoop, Flume. They've been PMC chairs. Um, and they've kind of come together to build the next generation of big data ingest at stream sets. So to frame this around, um, I've got a use case in product support. Now, this is kind of um, an MDM use case, a, a master data management use case. The authoritative source for different kinds of data tends to be in different places in the enterprise. So our uh, customer source uh, support platform might be a SaaS system, like Zendesk or Salesforce. <clears throat> Our HR system might be based around an on-premise relational database. Um, and these, these different uh, stores hold different kinds of data. So the uh, cloud SaaS uh, support system holds the status of support tickets and which engineer they're assigned to. The HR system stores the reporting structure, so which engineers roll up to which managers and directors. And then we might be supporting uh, some kind of devices that are giving us uh, data on status and faults. So 
through some other system, maybe some uh, IoT platform. And it's very difficult when data is spread out in this way to discover uh, the answers to questions like um, which director's team is actually servicing the most high priority tickets and getting notifications of uh, faults on devices where a ticket goes into a high priority state. So just as a level set, um, is anybody using uh, Apache Ignite or Grid Game? Mm, couple? Okay, good. So you can think of it, I guess, at the 30,000 foot view, pretty similar <coughs> in many ways to the technology Andy was talking about. In-memory database, very fast for um, fast analytical workloads, things like IoT, um, finance, where the difference between performing that 10x, 100x difference between performing work in memory versus from disk can make a real difference. Cybersecurity is another one actually. Analyzing uh, traffic fast enough so that you can react to it and uh, maybe prevent an attack. So um, what I did in when I started working with Ignite was to look at this use case to see how I could bring data together into this fast in-memory database to answer some of these questions. And there's a very interesting technology in Ignite called continuous queries. Now, uh, Ignite uh, refers to their in-memory database as a cache, okay? And a continuous query allows you to specify various pieces of code that are loaded into the database engine that run against uh, that data in the cache. And what you get to do is um, specify an initial query. Okay, your app starts, it maybe needs the current state of the data. And then you can say, um, I'm interested in uh, records, updates, uh, matching these keys. So you get to specify a filter. And then you get to specify the action that takes place. Maybe an update occurs on a particular record, that meets your filter, now you need to take some action. So you get to load these different uh, blocks of code into the database or run them in your application. And you can do many different kinds of queries. And the really crucial thing here is that the remote code actually executes in the database nodes as Java. So it's very fast and efficient. Uh, in contrast, your app has its own JVM and it's communicating with the database over a network protocol. So your listener code that's gonna take some action is running in its own uh, JVM. Now, I discovered that I could um, pass around uh, what we call in the Java world, POJOs, plain old Java objects. You can pass objects around the network, but there's a cost in doing so. We have to um, marshal those objects from their in-memory format into a wire format. And there's also, we have to move code around the network and things can get quite unmanageable. And as I was experimenting with this, I discovered binary objects. And a binary object is like a least common denominator in the Ignite world. It's a, um, a map of key values that is a kind of a generic object that we can pass around. So we don't have to guarantee that the same Java class is on both ends of the wire. We can just say name, pat, age, I'm not telling you, um, uh, country of origin, UK. We can just have that map of name value pairs that gets passed across the wire rather than having some Java object that the actual uh, class has to be sent as well. So we can make generic code that doesn't have to be kept in lockstep on both sides of the network. And we can even, <coughs> as well as retrieving whole records as they're changed, we can narrow the filter down. So not only can we filter on uh, particular predicates on the data, we can say, just return me this field. There's a thousand rows uh, on this table, but I'm really only interested in this field when an update or an insert occurs that matches my predicate. So we get to see some code. Um, it might not look too great at the back, but, and it's not, this isn't crucial. I'm just kind of illustrating how we start to put together an application. So at the top here, we're getting the cache object. And the crucial thing here is that you have to tell 
the system, I want to keep that binary object format. I don't want you doing anything clever with Java objects. And then you say, OK, I want to create a continuous query object. And I get to supply an initial query. And in the initial query can be some SQL. But in this case, um, it's a predicate in Java. Now, in this case, it's a very simple predicate. I'm returning whether a particular field converted to string equals some value. Okay, just about the most basic value equality predicate you can have. But this could be arbitrary code. Okay, you could be doing the lookup, you could go and be going to disk, to network, uh, be running some uh, arithmetic, some formula, anything you like here, basically to come back and say, this row is in my initial set that I want to see. And then um, later on, as data is changing, mutating, here it's the same filter, but again, you get to provide some Java code that executes in the database to say whether or not that record meets the, uh, the criteria that you're interested in. And then it's pretty simple. The, and, and again, these are we're basically supplying blocks of code here in this very terse, uh, this, this, came, this syntax came in with JDN7, something like that, Java 7. Um, and again, here we've got the local listener. So that code ex executes in the database. Database runs that to see if records map meet, come within our set. And if they do, it sends them across the wire, and this is what receives them. So here I'm saying, OK, I'm listening. I get some events. And for each event here for my demo app, I'm just going to get the key, get the value, and print out some diagnostics. And I could be doing some processing here based on the old value and the new value. So if it's uh, if it's an update or a delete, we get the old value. If it's an update or a create, we get the new value. Okay, so an update, we get the old and the new. And then when we run it, we've built this query thing. So we say, okay, run my query, and then it's going to give me back that initial data set. And then we basically go do something else because that listener executes asynchronously. So in reality, you wouldn't go into a tight loop sleeping every, for a second every time. Your app would be doing whatever other work it needed to do. But the crucial thing here is you can't just end here or else your app finishes. Um, you've got to keep it alive. And then that bit of code, every time an event happens, comes down the wire, that bit of code springs into action on its own thread and takes action. So semicolons and curly braces, um, it's all much clearer when we actually run something, so let's go do that. <coughs> so, uh, let me get command line. So that's Ignite running. Let's put the glasses on now. And then uh, if we go to, let's put some data in the database first. Okay, so I'm going to create a table of cities, and we're going to put four cities in there with their populations. And then we've got some initial data here set up. Okay, so we've got four cities, some population data, and uh, we're going to run my application. So this application is basically built around the code that you just saw. And uh, what it's going to do is the way the arguments work. Just go back to here. The way you, the arguments work is we in, we're interested in the city table, the name field. Where's it gone? Oh, the name field uh, equal to London. Uh, oh, I skipped. Yeah, so what we're interested in is filtering down to the city table to names that uh, include London, and there's our initial one, key number two, population, and London. So that's in our initial query round, and now if we change the data, so let's try increasing New York's population, somebody was born. 
So that happened there, and nothing happens over here. But if we skip back to Ignite, we can see our code with some diagnostics running in the database engine. So here, this was the initial query, and then event, evaluating cache entry event filter on binary object, and it was named New York, so it didn't meet my filter. So we can increase London's population. Somebody was born over there. And, sorry, uh, this one. Okay, and again, we can see here, name London, population, and over in our app, we got an update. Cache entry with ID2 was updated, so we get the old values and the new values, and it went from 8 million something two to 8 million something three. So we can see the code is executing different places, sending data, uh, sending code over the wire and sending data in return. So this is pretty nice, but um, it's sending the whole row. I've only got a couple of uh, columns here, but if there was a thousand columns, it would just send a thousand, the whole thing. So we can filter it down to only have the population. So this bit of code, what we do is we say, okay, I need a query, but this time it's a continuous query with a transformer. And then this code executes remotely and it gets the whole row and it returns whatever you're interested in. So here it's just going to get the value of a particular field and return the string representation. And again, the local listener, rather than getting whole records, now gets some value that you're, in this case it's a string, but it could be literally anything. It could be an integer, it could be uh, currency, whatever you like. So uh, let's go have a look. So if we grab, we actually have to run a different version of the demo. Let's move the demo over to the demo. So this time on the command line we specify population as well as the city name. So that's the field we're interested in, so it's a very generic uh, example. And then, so it's come up with London again and Let's not bother with New York because it's not going to be surprising that won't meet the criteria. But now when we say increase London again, now we only get that population field. That was all that was sent across the wire is those uh, seven characters. So we can optimize it right down to exactly the data that we're interested in. So this was pretty cool. This was my first exposure to Apache Ignite. Um, which is productized by Grid Game as their commercial offering. Um, and it all worked really, really nicely. And I learned quite a lot here. We need to enable uh, peer class loading so that our application can send all those rem remote bits of code to the server. So that's something that needs to be enabled in the uh, server configuration. By default, when you create tables from SQL, um, they get this name, SQL public, and then the table name that you have to refer to, but you can override that. So you can actually specify, okay, when I refer to it from the cache, I actually want to use this name, not this kind of SQL uh, database name, table name. Um, binary ob objects, as I mentioned already, make your life simpler and faster than passing around Java objects. And I discovered all of this and then I went to GitHub and found cache continuous query example.java that uh, I had independently recreated. So you can save yourself a lot of time by ring tfn. So, um, but hey, we're engineers, we like to learn, right? I wouldn't have learned as much if I'd just gone straight to that. So, the StreamSets Data Ops platform. And there's this lovely slide that our solutions architects like to talk around and take about 10 minutes to do it. But I think of it like this. It's basically a Swiss army knife for data. I can suck data out of, of the order of 40 or 50 different uh, input systems. So relational databases, flat files, um, message queues, Kafka, what have you, Salesforce. And um, I can emit it into a similarly large number of systems. So 
tends to be more biased towards big data stores, uh, Hadoop, Cassandra, uh, Elasticsearch, Solar, as well as relational databases, flat files, and so on. So it's a very, very useful tool. And what it actually boils down to is an IDE for building these data pipelines. So this is kind of like one of the core pipelines. And I won't step through this because it's much more interesting to see it in the app. But we drag pipeline stages into a sequence. Um, we can evaluate conditions to send records one way or another. So we're processing a stream of records. And we can discard, filter out, discard data we're not interested in, and then write interesting data into a database. And um, then we can do things like, if we have a couple of these different pipelines feeding, say, cases from Salesforce and bulk data from IoT platform into a single in-memory database, these kinds of queries run extremely quickly. And we can do things like only have current data in our in-memory database, right? Because memory is more expensive than disk. We can filter down the set that we want in that in-memory database to just what we, uh, what we need to react quickly to. <coughs> so we actually write through a generic JDBC driver, uh, JDBC interface, and Ignite has a JDBC driver. So the documentation encourages to use this thin driver. It's a little newer, there's, there's actually two options, um, but it fit my purposes very well. My mission was, can I build this use case with uh, stream sets that was created without Ignite in mind at all, just a generic JDBC interface, <coughs> um, and populate this in-memory database. And this thin driver, is just a very thin client that talks over the network like my application did to, uh, to Ignite. So it connects to a node in the cluster and it's very lightweight. It doesn't require much memory or disk space. So it comes in this jar as part of the Ignite distribution. Uh, the JDBC URL is JDBC Ignite thin and then host name port, etc. There's one wrinkle you've got to, when you're doing your, sending your queries through JDBC, everything must be uppercase, the table and column names. I actually filed a bug for this, uh, Ignite 9730. And there's also an older driver called the client driver that actually starts its own full client node. So it's got a replica of that in-memory database. Now that might be great if you want uh, if you're in a use case where you want a local replica and you're running data quickly against local data, but I wanted something slim that I could just make calls across the network. So let's see, and a very simple use case. Let's just read in some data from the CSV files and see if I can get this to work now. Come out of that. No, escape. I wish PowerPoint would come off the big screen when you tab away from it on the little screen. It gets me every time. So uh, let's go to browser and make that big. And I can uh, actually no, let's not use that because it's always turned out to be a pain. Let's just drag it. Okay. So let's just go. There we go. Right. So here's my pipeline. I could have had any number of origins here. Do HTTP, Kafka, blah, blah, blah. Just reading a deleted file from the disk. So I've got, I'm basically reading any CSV files from this device faults directory. And I send them through a number of stages. Now, the idea here is that uh, a data engineer or a data scientist can pull together one of, with one of these things without having to start writing code. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. You can Probably 80% of pipelines you can just use with use the off-the-shelf processors. Um, I create a UUID for each record, so I've got a built-in function to do that. I convert some records that read in a string from this CSV into specific types like date, time, and integer. And then I filter records on the fault code. So my devices, they're continually producing status data. Um, if it's a zero fault code, that means everything's working. And there's one of those every second, so I don't need to know that. I can just drop those on the floor. Um, but then, 
one, two, three, and four aren't very useful in this analytical database. So I actually <laughs> convert them uh, through a lookup to a string. So I can, for a small set of keys, I can define this one, two, three, four, critical, error, warning, info. Um, if I had, say, a thousand different keys and values, I could do a lookup into a relational database or a key value store like uh, uh, Redis. And then I write the, it all to Ignite. So Ignite, it's going through this JDBC connection and um, basically, by default, we'll um, write, we'll match on column names, but because Ignite JDBC driver insists on uppercase, I kind of have to do this, this mapping, so it's a, it's a bit painful. But um, with Oracle, I wouldn't even need to do anything if the names of the fields match the names of the data. And I can kind of have a look at how this is going to work by running a preview, which pulls the first 10 records from disk and then shows me what they're going to look like. So here's my first record, serial number, timestamp, and full code. And I get a bunch of metadata there, so the actual file name, the offset within the file, the time it was uh, modified, all this kind of good stuff. And then I can step through, and I can see the data changing as it's processed by the pipeline. So those timestamp uh, types were changed from strings. I can see that... Uh, this one didn't match the condition because it's zero, but if we scroll down, a couple of them, this one here matched the condition. Stream number one matched the condition. And we look up fault code one, it's critical, and then this is the data that's going to be written. So we're pretty confident now this is going to work, as confident as I ever am standing on stage. So reset the origin. Okay, I've run this before, I want to Ordinarily, it would wait for new data. I want to send it right back to the start. Press a button, stand back, and this number, yes. So, uh, and it gets to 86,400. So here's a good test, audience participation. Why 86,400? Any guesses? Yes, number of seconds in a day. I used to work with time series data, and that number is burnt on my brain. So we had 86,400 records, a day's worth of data, that's been ingested into Ignite in a, a couple of seconds. And let's go and pull a query so I don't have to type it. And uh, we can see here the first 10 faults, all critical and error. And uh, we can do you know, the usual kind of SQL-y stuff, like uh, faults by type. So there's 778 critical, 84 error, and so on. So it's a you know, as well as being this fast in memory, it's standard SQL. You can just write queries. And I'm actually going to delete them because this these day this day these days IoT data from flat files isn't very realistic. That was just like the simple uh, starter case. Because um, I've got a more realistic data architecture. So I actually have um, IoT data arriving via Kafka. Anybody not? Ever, any, has, okay, has anybody not heard of Kafka? It's like <laughs> the current thing. Okay, mm -hmm. Kafka. It's basically a messaging technology, distributed, high volume um, <coughs> messaging system. So you can feed data into one end, it will buffer in the system, and clients can read it from <coughs> the other end. Everybody uses it. Um, so that's my IoT data. I've got my HR data in MySQL, mainly because it'll fit on my laptop. Um, and I've got fault data in Salesforce, mainly because I used to work there and I know how the APIs work. So I've got three pipelines that are gonna combine it into Ignite so I can do all those nice analytical queries that join the data and give me uh, insights that I could never gain while it's siloed. All right, so let's see if this works. Yep. Right, so let's stop that pipeline. It's, incidentally, this is a streaming system. So this, that pipeline by default would just keep running, waiting for more CSV files to land in that directory and it'll process them as they arrive. <coughs> but let's go to Kafka device faults. So you'll notice 
that right up here, it's identical. Okay? All, literally all I did was copy the last pipeline, take out the read from directory and add write, read from Kafka, and, and it all remains the same. And this is actually quite a common use case um, of a, a exact, quite a common example of a phenomenon called data drift. The way that we work with data, its schema, its structure, its semantics, the way that we read it changes over time. So this kind of flexibility is really, really useful and much easier than if I had to go in and start hacking around with my code. And here again, I'm literally just connecting to a Kafka URI and reading JSON data this time. So if I start this running, I've got a little command line utility. Uh, well, actually, let's just let's just blast all the faults through for one day. Uh, let's go here. We don't need that guy anymore. So this is going to just feed them through Kafka as fast as it can. So that's those eighty-six thousand four hundred. They come through a little bit more slowly, but just because feeding through them through this message queue is slower than reading them straight. Is that five minutes? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, but then to make things, uh, so that was a whole day's arriving. Let's have them arriving in real time. So I've got this little script that will do that. And then they'll start arriving in onesies and twosies. And we've got like a little bit more uh, realistic situation of them arriving there. And we could go and say, uh, here they're just peeling across the screen there. And we can say, select. Uh, count star from fault. So we've got 885. Uh, of course, we're filtering them, so we've got many fewer than came in. We dropped a load on the floor. So 885 went up to 888. The first time I did that, I forgot about that, and I was like, why have I got 1% of my records? Because I carefully rigged the data to come out with 1%. Um, so, uh, let's run another pipeline. So we've got faults arriving in real time. <coughs> let's get the employees. So I've run it before, so again, just quickly reset. Yes, close. We could do a preview. I'm just going to blast them through. So that ran immediately because, guess what, I only had 17 employees. 19 records came out because it's sending events to this stage, which is going to stop the pipeline because this is a batch process. And now I can say, okay, uh, get the employee table. I can say, okay, who reports to uh, the director, Hannah Bates? Okay, there's three people that roll up to Hannah. And um, we've got our employee and uh, device data. So now, unsurprisingly, oh, there it is. We're going to load case data from Salesforce. I don't need to munge around with this much because I'm just having a replica of that data. So again, just reset so I get all the data that's there. And it's going to run fast because there's only eight cases. And uh, just let me quickly run uh, oh, 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 that one. Um, and they'll be in the system. So I can go and I can say, OK. Which managers have engineers working on high priority cases? So I can run that query, and it says Kim Park and Hannah Bates each have uh, handling one. They're the director. Okay, this is always SQL. Their teams are handling one high priority case. And go to Salesforce cases and say, okay, let's make this low priority high, and save, and go across and repeat that query. And now Kim Park's handling two cases. So um, what happened there? Because I changed it in Salesforce. That Salesforce pipeline is live, and it went from eight to nine records. It's actually got a live connection to Salesforce with notifications coming across. So every time I go and change something here, so let's change another one to high priority, quickly. This will go up from 9 to 10, and then the results of this query change. So now it's 3 three to 1 in terms of cases. OK, so now we're able to join this data. And in my final two minutes, 
I'll do what I promised to do. Uh, oh, yeah, there's a, few, there's a few caveats here. I found a bug in the JDBC driver when I was doing this, and that's going to be fixed in the upcoming 2.8 release of Ignite. Basically, when you query the schema, uh, it lies to you about the primary keys of a table, so I had to work around that. I don't have time to talk about that in detail. Okay, so my application is going to listen for high priority service tickets. So when a service ticket changes state to high priority, it's going to get the last 10 uh, sensor readings. So we're actually doing a couple of different things here. We're running um, a query, but we're also running one of these uh, listeners. So this listener is going to execute, and then when it, hear, when it sees, when the remote filter says, oh, this case is high priority, it's going to execute that query and give me the last 10 faults. So again, joining data from Salesforce and the uh, IoT platform. So, uh, where is my app? It's uh, demo two. Uh, start up and connect it to the cluster, Wait, waiting for high priority cases. So if we go and this is actually extremely surprising because it's all actually working. Oh, of course I've said that now, haven't I? So we change this to high priority, hit save, go across really quickly and what should happen? So device serial number, Last 10 critical error faults, there were only two. Uh, one critical and one error, and let's just for fun go do another one. I'm running out of cases now that are not high priority, so high, save, see if we can find them with a few more. Last 10 critical, oh, <laughs> no, that one didn't seem to have gone wrong at all. Let's do this one, and save. I should remember the one that's got a big list. Okay, that's got one. But you get the idea, I mean, this list is greater or smaller, depending on how many faults are in the system for that particular um, device. And we can wrap up. So, <coughs> so that's one use case, this master data management case, bringing data from disparate systems into one place. We also, uh, we see that as well as in-memory cases, we see that with data lakes. So replatforming your data out of, say, Oracle, where it's really expensive to keep vast quantities of data into Hadoop, where it's much cheaper. Um, IoT use cases, so we kind of saw a little bit about that, that. The last two are really fascinating, cybersecurity and real-time apps. We actually have a user who has a real-time cybersecurity application monitoring server and firewall log logs applying machine learning uh, algorithms, so comparing the traffic to a model, and then when um, an, a, an alert is triggered, it actually reaches into the Amazon firewall settings and changes the setting. So it's a closed loop system. Very, very cool, and it will react within 10 seconds. So it sees suspicious traffic, and it shuts that client out, of the fly, uh, out via the Amazon firewall within 10 seconds. Really cool stuff. Um, we've got many, many customers now. We closed our quarter today, so Salesforce has been busy, but these are a few we've had for a while. GlaxoSmithKline, the um, international pharmaceutical company, have hundreds of thousands of pipelines. They use it to bring siloed research data into a single data lake, so um, basically the results of drug trials into one place so that they can do analysis across that uh, body of data. Uh, E-Trade um, unifies all security log data, so another cybersecurity use case into a single location. So again, you can do analysis across your entire body of, of data. And then CBS, um, they are doing data science around revenue, quality control, and uh, ad inventory. So very, very different applications. Um, because as I said, it's really a Swiss army knife. It doesn't care, you know, it doesn't matter which particular industry you're in. So, wrapping it up. 
Um, Ignite continuous queries are a really nice uh, way of executing, um, uh, running this notification mechanism very robustly and very quickly. This thin JDBC driver met my needs because it's uh, footprint characteristics, but it's still a bit of a work in progress. Um, promises to be a useful, lightweight alternative to the older client driver where you get a full Ignite database node as part of your app. And then uh, my little plug, um, I can read, we can, I can use data to, to read and write data from a wide variety of sources and uh, write into Ignite. And there are a few references here. Uh, I'll leave those up and see if there's any questions. Yeah. If you had uh, gone to Salesforce and made one of those low priority and then made it high again, would you get a, another triggering? Great question. So the question was, if I'd gone into Salesforce, and I, I could do it, but to save time, I'll just explain. Um, so the short answer, if I'd gone into Salesforce, made one of them low and then high again, yes, you would get another trigger because my logic is pretty simplistic. But of course, I could code around that to meet whatever requirement because I'm just running my Java code in, in the database, right? I could remember the fact that I'd seen that one already put it in, a, in its own cache. But yeah, it's, 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 it's observing that state change and taking action on that state change, which may or may not be what you want to do. Stunned you all into silence. <laughs> or we just all full of this 